So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the aldol reaction and diastereoselectivity. And then we'll talk about some sort of fun rearrangements. So um, you guys are probably aware of the challenges associated with doing a crossed aldol because there's a lot of uh, products that you can get. And so the strategy that uh, people use for this is to make an enolate in a quantitative fashion first. So we would use LBA or some very strong base uh, to get you quantitative yield of the enolate. And uh, then, and only then, do you add um, the second reactive partner in this case, we'll choose an aldehyde. I don't mean to go in there good enough. And uh, you want to keep things cold because you don't want this enolate to deprotonate that aldehyde because then you're going to start having uh, a mixture of products. Your desire is to get the product where the enolate was the one you wanted it to be and the uh, electrophile that gets attacked by the enolate was the other one. So uh, you have to be careful and keep things cold to avoid enolate exchange. Should I turn off the light? There was one time um, when my sons were a lot younger and I was reading them, uh, trying to read them a book called Fable Haven by Brandon Mull, uh, and it's a pretty interesting book, but uh, I was tired and sort of falling asleep while I was reading it to them, and so I, I was reading, reading, paused, and my, my <laughs> oldest son says, Dad, are you stuck on a word? <laughs> what? Sound it out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yes, I was, I was stuck on a word. Um, right. So... There aren't a lot of um, stereochemistry, well, I guess there are stereochemistry choices here because uh, you have, depending on the substitution of your uh, starting material that you want to make an enolate out of, your nucleophile and your electrophile, you can generate up to two stereocenters. And so um, which what configuration do the stereocenters have uh, relative to each other is important. We're not necessarily in the aldol reaction concerned about absolute stereochemistry because we don't have chiral reagents. But we might be concerned about relative stereochemistry. That is, do you get one of the two possible configurations at each center? Do you get um, uh, one diastereomer as the major product or the other? And uh, we'll make this a little bit more general. I'm going to give you a ketone here, and we're going to just not worry about what the R groups as listed are. Um, we will first make the enolate quantitatively. That will involve deprotonating that alpha carbon. Uh, and then in a second step, we will bring in an aldehyde. And uh, the product, of course, uh, you should get good at recognizing, if you're not already, uh, aldol products. They're beta-hydroxycarbonyl compounds, or they can be alpha-beta-unsaturated carbonyl compounds. So this is the aldol product. You have an alpha carbon that was from your enolate, and then you've got the carbonyl carbon from your aldehyde, which then becomes the beta carbon in your final product. And so you've got the possibility for a couple of different diastereomers here, right? You've got, um, we can have the OH and the R2 group sort of on the same side of the molecule when we've drawn it this way. We could call this a syn diastereomer, though um, Sin versus anti always depends on like relative to what. Um, 
So in this case, if we draw the aldol product in an extended conformation, the OH and the R2 groups are on the same side, we would get both enantiomers, which I'll indicate with that symbol. And then you'd have the other possibility, which would be to have the OH and the R2 groups on opposite sides, which we might call the antidiastereomer. And of course, we'd get the other enantiomer as well. Now the question is, um, is there a preference? And if so, can we understand why? Um, diastereomers don't have to be formed in equivalent amounts. And so this is where uh, a mechanistic proposal provided some insight. Um, and it relies on something called the Zimmerman Traxler transition state. Uh, Professor Howard Zimmerman was a chemist at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he was still alive when I was there. Um, and this is a pretty important contribution. So uh, Zimmerman and Traxler envisioned the transition state of the aldol reaction in, uh, of these materials with lithium uh, with LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide, could involve uh, a six-membered ring transition state. So this is going to look like a chair. I'm going to have the oxygen of the enolate here, then the double bond oops, of the enolate there, um, an R1 group here, and then an R2 group there, and we'll have lithium in the back connected to that oxygen. All right, and let's see. Then we'll have the aldehyde oxygen and the aldehyde R3 group here, and the aldehyde oxygen can be coordinating the lithium. So that's one possible arrangement of this particular enolate. And notice that under these conditions, you're getting the E enolate, you're getting a trans, I'm sorry, the Z enolate, you're getting a cis relationship between the oxygen and the R2 group. Um, all right, then we could draw potentially another option for a transition state. Let me think about that. An alternative would be to keep uh, would be to switch the positions of R3 and the proton. That, that would involve basically flipping the aldehyde over, uh, doing the reaction from the other base of the aldehyde. All right. Um, and this is a transition state, and so is that one. Um, let's see if we can figure out which of these two transition states is better and which leads to a product. So uh, given what you know about um, chairs and chair conformations, which of these two transition states do you think is better? Yeah, you, uh, Rachel, you predict the one on the left as being better. Why is that? Um, well, it's like a pseudo chair, mm -hmm. and the R3 group is in the equatorial position, which is axial. Okay, so R3 equatorial versus axial here. So uh, that's all other things being equal. Presumably, e we'd like it even better if this were the E enolate with the R group down here, and uh, I'm not 
totally sure what controls whether we form the E or the Z in the late. I'm trying to remember. We talked about that last time. And I think the idea was that uh, really cold conditions give you Yeah, I'm not sure why in this example we don't have the E enolate. In any case, let's just assume enolate stereochemistry is set for us, that the stereochemistry we get, and it's, prob it's probably dependent on the size of the R2 and the R1 groups. Enolate happens to be C. Okay, right, it's an issue of the R3 group is equatorial versus the R3 group is axial. Otherwise, we're tolerating having the R2 group axial and the R1 group is in this sort of pseudo equatorial position because of the double bond. So here's how we're gonna push arrows. These electrons from the oxygen lithium bond will kick down to form, reform the carbonyl. Uh, and let me just label carbons for you here. This is the carbonyl carbon of the aldehyde. Uh, then the electrons between carbonyl carbon of the enolate and the uh, alpha carbon will attack the carbonyl carbon. And then uh, these electrons will move up onto the oxygen and lone pairs will attack the lithium or chelate the lithium, right? Uh, and so we can draw, it's, and it's thought that that six-member green transition state facilitates the reaction and helps control reaction diastereoselectivity. Because you'll notice after we make that bond, stereochemistry is set at both of those stereocenters. Um, and of course, after aqueous workup, that would be proton. So uh, again, let's compare. We've decided which transition state is better, but let's uh, try to figure out what product stereochemistry we're going to have. All right. Um, so if we follow the zigzag of the carbonyl compound, one, two, three, one, two, three. Here's the R3 group. Um, it would appear from our perspective like the OH would be out towards us and the R group, which would be out towards us, right? So we would have a preference for. Because we pass through the lower energy transition state, we expect the syn diastereomer to be favored. And then, of course, um, Is that right? I'm struggling to do it in my brain, but I think it is. Yeah, okay. So this is another example of sort of kinetic control leading to a product that passes through a lower energy transition state. So that's just something to be aware of in in Ochem, we tend to like six-member green transition states because we know that um, six-member greens involve minimal strain. All right, so that's sort of gee whiz, but it, it can be used to predict um, which diastereomer should be preferred. Okay, questions about that? Did you always know? Yeah, is it always like this, sin versus anti? Well, what you call it doesn't necessarily matter. Whether, it's, whether we call it sin or anti will really depend on whether we have this 
enolate R2 group in the axial versus equatorial position. And that's constrained by the stereochemistry of the enolate. So in this example, we're getting the enolate that has the R2 group cis to the oxygen, and we'd call that the Z enolate. And we haven't talked about how to predict enolate e, Z versus, e versus Z selectivity. There's literature on that, but we're just not doing it. So accepting that this is that you do form the Z enolate with that in place, then it's better to have the R3 group equatorial than axial. And that's going to set the stereochemistry here. Um, so yeah, there will be a preference to have the R3 group in axial, in equatorial versus axial. And that's just an issue of flipping the aldehyde over, right? Um, in order to get the R2 group at this equatorial position, we would have needed to make the E enolate. And I don't know, does anybody know anything about E versus E enolates and how, how to selectively form one versus the other? I mean, the, the example that I got from your book suggested it was a kinetic versus thermodynamic issue. Um, the idea that the Z enolate was maybe more stable uh, because it has the large groups opposite each other, whereas the E enolate has the large groups cis to each other. And then if you go up to room temperature, you would preferentially form the Z enolate. So uh, presumably this has you using the more stable stable enolate, and I'm not sure how you form that selectively, other than maybe you do this at room temperature. Yeah? Um, I'm just trying to make sure I understand how we get from, like, after the chair to the one with the stereo center. Yes. So, did you just kind of, like, did you assign R and S, or did you, like, just kind of visualize it? I didn't assign R and S in my head. What I did was... I paid attention to the directions the carbons were pointing. Okay, uh, so this uh, the carbon with the R two and the H group is that that um, is angled sort of upward. Uh, and if I were to lay this, all of the things being equal, if I were to lay it back so the upward pointing pointing carbon were in the plane of the page the proton would be pointing out towards me and the R group would be going out back. Like if, if this were a chair. Um, and, and I tipped it back so that these two bonds were in the plane of the page, the R group would be behind and the proton would be coming out front. And then I noticed that in my drawing down here, that alpha carbon is pointing downward. So that means I've swung this around now so the R group is in the front. You can assign R versus S if you want and make sure it's the same. Um, and then I did sort of a similar thing here. Uh, I noticed that, sorry, let's see, I noticed that uh, the, for the beta carbon in this drawing, the two bonds, one to R3 and one to alpha, are pointing downward. And so if I were to draw a downward stereo center there, uh, the proton, a downward carbon there, the proton is going to swing up to be in front and the OH group is going to be in the back. But then I, the way I happen to have drawn it here, yeah. A little bit, just a little bit tricky. That's just in the uh, in the you know, working through it in the brain. So I don't recommend trying to memorize sin versus anti being preferred, and then trying to jump straight to this. What I do recommend is drawing the transition state, drawing the product, and then you've got it right. Whether or not you can actually convert it into the flat drawing with stereo centers. If you stopped there, I would have to say that is a correct answer, right? So, uh, but, but if you need to, 
but knowing uh, professors and how they like to be mischievous, if you were given a multiple choice question, almost certainly you would have to choose between these answers as drawn there, and so you'd have to convert from your answer to that one. The ways to do that involve building a model, or assigning R versus S, or getting really good at uh, thinking about molecules in your brain. Okay, other questions? Okay, it is time for the mind-blowing rearrangements. So, you've heard of carbocation rearrangements, and we've done some of that in, uh, as we talked about carbocations, especially the non-classical carbocations. We talked about how it's unclear, uh, depending on the situation, for a carbocation rearrangement, whether uh, having the proton shared between two carbons is um, a transition state or an intermediate. Um, but we're going to be talking about other rearrangements that actually don't, uh, well, in some cases involve carbocations, other times, other times don't. Um, these rearrangements are going to look weird until you start to think about uh, these sort of orbitals that might be involved, and then, and the geometry uh, of the, those orbitals, and then it will start to make some sense. These are rearrangements you'll sometimes hear people talk about in, uh, in total synthesis or synthetic organic chemistry talks. Uh, we like to drop names and um, there's a, if you ever want to know about name reactions and all of them, there's like, I forget what it's called, but I think it's organic, oh, no, we're not gonna do that. Organic chemistry portal. Stupid. And you can go to organic reactions. Let's see, where was it? Well, now it doesn't matter because I'm wasting all kinds of time. So, oh well. Yes, see, it was there. It's just hard to navigate to. So here is a list of all of the named reactions that tend to be uh, referred to in talks as their various names. And some of these rearrangements are among them. Um, yeah, anyway, so it's kind of overwhelming. Um, one of the ones I thought was weird I don't know, one of them is just an SN2 reaction, but it happens to have a name, which I thought was kind of funny. All right, in any case, uh, the first rearrangement we're gonna talk about is called the Pinnacle rearrangement. Pinnacle is what we call um, uh, a one, two bisonal diol. And so under acidic conditions, you basically start doing sort of like alcohol dehydration types of mechanistic steps. You protonate one of the OH groups, which is gonna subsequently leave because it becomes water, a good leaving group. And then you have a carbocation. And uh, this generates a pattern, or rather you can recognize this 
the situation where this might happen. You've got a positive charge on one carbon, and then on carbon beta to that, you have what we would call an electron donating group, or something that has lone pairs that could stabilize a positive charge. So uh, do you remember when we did uh, carbocation rearrangements, you know, back in the, in the day, uh, how we said, oh, if you can rearrange to make a uh, carbocation more stable via a 1,2 methyl or 1,2 hydride shift, you'll do it, right? Yeah. The hydride sort of hops over so you can get a more substituted carbocation, right? We're going to do that here, only it's not going to be a hydride that moves. It's going to be an alkyl shift. We're going to do a 1,2 alkyl shift so that the positive charge can be adjacent to the oxygen. So there's a couple ways to push arrows. Some people like to do this in, in different ways. It doesn't really matter. You can do the one, two alkyl shift just directly. And that's gonna involve uh, sort of leaning over of the methyl group uh, into the empty P orbital associated with that carbocation. And then you've got the positive charge on, oops, that's not the right arrows I wanted. I wanted resonance arrows. You got, and the positive charge is, new. come on guys, are you gonna let me do that? That's embarrassing. Um, we can draw a resonance structure in which we put lone pairs from the oxygen into make the pi bond, and then the positive charge is on the oxygen. Do you see how those two are resonance structures? Sometimes people will push arrows as follows because they like to imagine the oxygen helping the process along. Uh, and it's fine, it doesn't really matter, but you can make the double bond and move the alkyl group over. Um, when, when people do this, I'm, I'm like, oh, I've never thought of a carbon, or I've never thought of a methyl group as a leaving group. So I almost prefer this because it shows that it's just a rearrangement, but you'll see it uh, both ways. And then uh, you can regenerate your acid catalyst by removing the proton from the carbonyl compound. That converts your pinnacol into a ketone. Notice that um, there was no oxidation reduction in this step, we simply took a carbon, a, a molecule with two carbon heteroatom bonds, and we put those two carbon heteroatom bonds with the same carbon. All right, uh, questions about that? Uh, is this something that you can plan for or just observe? Uh, it's not clear to me that anytime you have a diol, this rearrangement occurs. I don't think that's true. I think, though, that it can happen, and when it does, you now know why. <laughs> um, so this would be the kind of question that you'd encounter here would be not uh, predict what would happen, but rather, given what happened, can you push the arrows and explain what happened? And again, the essential thing is here, just a one, two alkyl shift. All right. Anything else about that? Okay, fun rearrangement number two. This is a word I didn't know existed. Benzylic acid rearrangement. Um, Sometimes in OCHEM, we name things according to the products and not the starting materials. So the name suggests, oh, we're gonna rearrange benzylic acid, but actually we're going to rearrange something else to make benzylic acid, so whatever. Um, your starting material is a diketone, an alpha Diketone, and this happens to be called benzyl. I don't know who made that up. Um, and this happens under basic <coughs> conditions. So you have quick attack of a negatively charged oxygen on one of the two 
carbonyls. This is fast, and it's basically the first step in hemiacetal formation. So we'll draw that intermediate. And then what happens next is basically the rearrangement step, uh, and it is the rate determining step, kind of slow. Um, it looks kind of different than we saw for uh, the pinnacle rearrangement, where we had. Um, an electron donating group on a carbon uh, on a, adjacent to an electron deficient carbon. But uh, if you sort of relax your eyes a little bit, you can see a similar situation. We have an electron donating group adjacent to an electron deficient carbon. And in fact, I mean, if you want to see that even more completely, you could, I suppose, draw the following resonance structure where you put a positive charge on that carbon. All right. So as we saw before, we, we can do um, a one, two, in this case, aryl shift, but we're going to take an R group and shift it over. Now, uh, I'll show you arrow pushing that make it just look like this one, two arrow shift, a carbocation rearrangement. Um, and then I'll show you arrow pushing that people like better. <laughs> This, doing it this way highlights that this is basically just a carbocation rearrangement. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yikes. Okay, drawing it this way highlights that it's a carbocation rearrangement, though we would definitely prefer to draw this as... <coughs> the one where we have these electrons move down to form a pi bond. Okay, If you wanted to avoid all of this business of resonance structures, uh, you can just as easily have the electrons from the negatively charged oxygen kick down and then have the aryl group shift over into the pi star of the carbonyl oxygen and then electrons go up onto that carbonyl oxygen. Okay, but yeah, you've got, we'll use the color blue for electron poor oxygen, and then you have an electron rich group on an adjacent atom, and that's sort of the situation when this can happen. Uh, it gives you this uh, acid, um, if you want to be cute, you can propose a uh, proton internal sort of protonation of that uh, alkoxide by your acid through a five-membered ring intermediate to get this carboxylate and then envision acidic aqueous workup to restore the acid and the overall change in this reaction. It's very much like the pinnacle rearrangement. Um, you take, we used to have four carbon oxygen heteroatom bonds. We still have four oxygen carbon heteroatom bonds are just in, arranged differently. Can, can this, uh, uh, <coughs> can it, this um, before the acid work up, when you have the orange yeah. arrow, can it be interchangeable with like the, the arrow showing you right now between these two? Oh, here? Yeah, these two, these two, because it can, it can be in this direction. Can also be in this so, so uh, yeah, you might propose actually 
that, um, yeah, that w it would be interesting to propose. I think what you're proposing is uh, um, that the following two things are resonant structures of each other. So I'll just, so we get rid of the arrows, I'll redraw this. which would imply that that hydrogen were sort of shared evenly between those two negatively charged oxygens. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. Um, I would tend to think it would be more like this simply because there's a difference in the pKa's of this negatively charged oxygen versus that one. Right, uh, a regular alcohol is around 16, carboxylic acid is around four. So I would think that, um, oh, no, uh, the, the benzene rings cannot delocalize the negative charge on that oxygen because they are not conjugated to that oxygen. Do you see how there's an sp3 atom in between the benzene ring and the oxygen? Yeah. So all the water is in the pKa is just by the temperature. You drop this other oxygen, you're going to get an acid there. Right. Yes. Uh, the difference in pKa's between having an OH here versus there has to do with this carbonyl group. But right, if, if the pKa here is around 4, whereas the pKa here is around 16, that would tell you there's a pretty strong driving force to have the proton here bonded to that oxygen and not shared between the two. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay, so that's, some of these rearrangements, I get, like I said, are just sort of cute as a way to show you the kinds of things that can happen because unless you actually want to make this molecule, I'm not sure why you would do this. Um, there are some more uh, interesting and perhaps synthetically useful uh, reactions that are both rearrangements and have the names of dead people <laughs> in them. Um, So the Beckman rearrangement involves a functional group that I alluded to um, earlier, but uh, that we didn't spend a lot of time talking about, and that is the oxime. The oxime is an imine, only the instead of using a regular amine, you use hydroxyl amine. And, um, this is an acid catalyzed rearrangement and you can use it to convert the oxime into an amide. Okay, so pay attention to what's got to happen here. It's basically we have to uh, trade places where the oxygen is and where one of the methyl groups are. Uh, oxidation state wise, notice we've um, got two carbon heteroatom bonds and a heteroatom heteroatom bond. Uh, we end up with two carbon uh, oxygen bonds and two carbon nitrogen bonds. So um, the, it seems like the uh, nitrogen oxygen bond is good for two carbon oxygen heteroatom bonds. Um, all right, so this is acid catalyzed. So uh, your intuition on this is, is great. We're gonna protonate the OH group um, and that will convert it into a decent leaving group. All right, and this is where things get a little, a, a little strange. Uh, notice that you have uh, basically a similar pattern. You've got uh, an electron deficient nitrogen 
it's attached to a leaving group, right? And then you have an alkyl atom adjacent to an electron deficient uh, leaving group. Now, if we were to think about geometry here, um, notice where, uh, if we were to think about breaking this nitrogen-oxygen bond, let's just sort of draw the nitrogen-oxygen sigma star and show ourselves where it is. Um, I'm just going to use hash marks for shading. Uh, do you see how the geometry of the double bond makes it so that the methyl group lines up perfectly in the plane of the page with that sigma star? Yep. Um, and that geometry is constrained by the presence of this pi bond and that nitrogen. Remember the uh, the nitrogen is, is basically kind of sp2 hybridized. You've got another lone pair there. So what we're going to see is rearrangement of a 1-2 alkyl shift. But instead of shifting into uh, an, an empty non-bonding orbital like a positive charge, which is what we saw up here for the pinnacle rearrangement, we're going to have the alkyl group, the methyl group, simply dump itself into the sigma star and break the nitrogen-nitrogen bond. Sorry, oh, yeah, nitrogen-oxygen bond. Yeah, thank you. All right, so if we follow that through, <clears throat> then what you have at this stage Keep track, remember that lone pair on the oxygen. You have what's called a nitrillium ion and its resonance stabilized. This is another sort of theme in some of these rearrangements that we're seeing that when we, ha that we can get, at, because of the rearrangement, we can get a resonance stabilized cation. Right. Um, this looks like a, a substituted nitrile, actually, which is why they call it an a, a nitrillium ion, and those are resonance structures of each other. All right, so um, that was, if you're looking at where we need to end up, we want to make this amide, we've already put the methyl group on the nitrogen. Now it's just a matter of getting the oxygen in place. Well, that's where water comes in. We will have water attack the electron deficient carbon, sort of looks like the carbonyl carbon. We can do that from either resonance structure. Um, either way is okay. And that will generate um, the following intermediate. Which then proton and that gets us to an intermediate that is known instead of as an amide, it's called an imidate. And uh, what I could show you next um, would just be sort of proton transfer. So I'm just going to use these equilibrium arrows and write tautomerize here. <laughs> is that all right? Essentially, you have to uh, add a proton to this nitrogen first, then electrons kick down. Uh, if you protonate the nitrogen first, then you've got a resonance structure where you can have a pi bond here and a sigma bond there, and then you deprotonate the carbonyl oxygen. Okay, so that can take your oxime and turn it into an amide. Uh, along the way, because of this rearrangement step, it's like you inserted the nitrogen into the bond, uh, into one of these bonds between the carbonyl carbon and the... Uh, yeah? What will encourage you the energy transfer to the nitrogen from the way? Um, the fact that carbon oxygen bond, pi bonds are more stable than carbon nitrogen bonds because oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So yeah, this is again acid catalyzed, so presumably 
we would first protonate that oops, nitrogen. Uh, and then we would see that that is simply a resonance structure oops, for And then we would regenerate our acid by having water remove that proton and that will get us there. Okay. Um, all right. Did you like, oh, sorry, the second step. Can we talk about um, alpha conjugation as well? Like Here? Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, this is, um, it would be hyperconjugation that would allow electrons in this carbon-carbon bond to partially donate into the sigma star. But now we're moving beyond hyperconjugation because now we're not just partially donating, we're like fully, completely moving it over. Yep. Okay. I, anyway, I think... These are kind of cute little rearrangements because if you look at here starting material and here product, you're like, how on earth did that happen? And then you actually look at the steps and you're like, oh, it's not that bad. It's just a bunch of proton transfers um, and one, two rearrangements. Okay. Um, heck reaction. Um, that's not a rearrangement, but we can. I'll have to do some learning first before I know too much about it. Um, let's see. Hoffman will be the next reaction named after a dead guy. And Hoffman rearrangements are for primary amides. And it's uh, kind of wild. You start out with this primary amide. You're going to use bromine and you're going to use base, sodium hydroxide. And in the end, you're going to end up with an alkylamine, right? And this R group is now attached to this nitrogen. And the carbonyl carbon leaves is CO2. Again, why on earth would you want to do this? Um, because it seems like amides are more difficult to make than amines, so why would you do this? And again, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it was developed during a, diff a different time, and it also involves a kind of uh, moving of a group over. Um, we'll save that for next time, though, because we're basically out of time. Um, right. How many more rearrangements do we have to do? I've got like two, three more pages. Schmidt rearrangement, Bayer Villiger oxidation, and the Favorsky rearrangement, and not to be outdone, the pseudo Favorsky rearrangement. Uh, chemists, right? All right.